Hello, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault presented by Blinzall. If you're in the market for some high quality racing oil for your two stroke or four, make sure you go to blinzall.com and use our discount code VAULT20 to save 20% at checkout. Thank you for all the support. This is Hannah. This is Bailey. This is Pooters. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you didn't want to torture her. <laughs> Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Motocross Vault. <laughs> I hope you like our intro. Hello and welcome back to the Motocross Vault. My name is Tony Blazer, and what this video is going to cover is Suzuki's all-new RM125 for 2001. Now, I'd had the, the previous generation RM. I bought a brand new one in 96. I love that bike. I know a lot of pros didn't really care for it, but I, I really enjoyed that machine. And it was a good machine for a couple of years there. It was never the top of the class, but they were competitive. But by 2000, you know, they were getting a little long in the tooth. They had added this ridiculous snow shovels to the shrouds. I don't know why they did that. I mean, obviously, it was probably for airflow, but it looked terrible. I hated it. Pretty telling that uh, the factory Suzuki team didn't even run them in 2000. They were so goofy looking. So not a fan of that overall design. But when this 2001 came out, it was a really dramatic change. Uh, the bike is all new from the ground up. Everything is new. The suspension, the frame, the engine, complete redesign. And it really was a quantum leap in terms of styling and overall design different than the old machine. Even the color was different. This new 2001, they came out with what they call the champion yellow, which was a uh, more of a day glow yellow. It's kind of like what Honda did in 92 when they went to the nuclear red versus the, the more orangey flash red. Pretty dramatic shade. If you saw them parked next to each other, it was a pretty dramatic difference at the time. And I remember looking, going to the new, uh, see the new bikes at JT Motorsports in Frederick, and they had a 2000 RM right next to the 2001, and they looked like they were 10 years apart. It was pretty dramatic. Um, so definitely in terms of styling, they really hit it out of the park in this 2001 design. And the fact that really this bike, in my opinion, still looks great today, 20 years after it came out. Uh, is telling that Suzuki kind of did a, a really good job with the styling on this machine. Performance-wise, the RMs in this year, they had a tough time kind of keeping up with the YZ125, but this 2001 was a very competitive machine. And you'll see in the review, it was you know, well-liked by most testers. And depending on the kind of rider you were and your skill level and what have you, it may have been the best bike. It just depends on you know kind of what you're looking for out of your 125. Good machine, though. Uh, Suzuki, as I said, this would be the last generation of 125. I wish they'd bring another one back. Uh, but at least this last generation was a pretty good machine. Certainly much more competitive than some of the ones they'd had in the past. Now, if you like this sort of thing, you can check out some of the other videos I did. I just did a review of the history of Honda's XR200R. I've also done ones on the CR80, uh, the CR250. I did a two-parter on the CR, Honda CR250 where I looked at the, all of them from 1973 through uh, its demise in 2007. I actually plan on doing some Suzuki ones in the future. I've had several people ask for like a PE-175 history. So I love enduro bikes. Never had a PE-175, but I like enduro bikes. They're fun. I did have a KDX 200 and XR 200 and what have you. So I'll be doing stuff like that in the future. So check out my channel. I have lots of reviews of both motocross and off-road machines. Even have a few ATVs on there. Uh, so I try to mix it up. I love all off-road stuff. So if you like this kind of thing, check out some of the other videos on my channel. I have a, a wide variety of off-road stuff. If you like to support what I do, I just came out with an all-new Honda XR design uh, based on the 1985 Honda XRs. I also have uh, merch. If you like Suzuki's, I have a RM125 design based on uh, the uh, Tough Racing Suzuki's in 1991 that Ronnie Tishner rode, and also several different Suzuki's based on you know different ones from different eras. I have a really cool, uh, again, I think it's cool. I designed it, but it's a, <laughs> one based on Ricky Carmichael's Makita Suzuki, and I have an Evolution of Suzuki design as well where I show all the RMs basically from the uh, beginning uh, up until the last of the um, two-stroke RMs in the mid-2000s. So, again, there'll be a, a link in the description below. And if you'd like to support what I do, I certainly appreciate it. If you could like, subscribe, and share on social media, I would really appreciate that as well. So here is the story of the 2001 Suzuki RM125. The late 1990s were a tough time to be riding anything but blue in the 125 class. Starting in 1996, Yamaha's YZ125 had enjoyed a virtual stranglehold on the titular division. For most riders, the Yamaha's mixture of broad power, good suspension, and do-it-all handling was a tough combination to beat. Before Yamaha's ascension in 1996, however, it was Suzuki that enjoyed the mantle of the best 125 in the land. These early to mid-90s RMs had offered razor-sharp handling, punchy motors, and great forks. They were not as fast on top as Honda's streaking CR125, but they were easier to ride and better all-around machines. In 1996, Suzuki had introduced an all-new RM125 they hoped would continue their run at the top of the 125 division. 
1996 machine featured sexy new bodywork, a redesigned engine, and a switch back to conventional forks for the first time since 1989. While the bike handled great, and the forks worked phenomenally well, the motor package was just not up to running with the most powerful machines in the class. Its low to mid burst motor was fun, but not particularly fast, and a handicap against the brawny Yamaha and blazing fast Honda. Over the next few years, Suzuki refined its 125 package, but it never quite lived up to the success of the 93 through 1995 design. In 1999, they moved away from their excellent conventional Shawa forks to a more standard but less effective inverted alternative. That year, they also bolted on a massive 38mm carburetor to pump up the top end pull. This gave the 99 and 2000 RMs lots of revs, but not a ton of effective power. Both bikes could be revved to the moon, but neither one offered much in the way of torque. For really fast guys, this was not an issue, but for most mere mortals, the broad power of the YZ was better. For 2001, Suzuki knew they were going to have to swing for the fences if they were going to unseat the perennial champion in the 125 class. To do this, their engineers dialed up a complete redesign of their 125 package. Literally everything from the diameter of the clutch cable to the shape of the front fender was scrutinized in an effort to produce a faster, lighter, and more competitive racer. First up on the chassis side was an all-new frame that looked to both improve handling and reduce weight. The new frame continued to use chromoly steel for its construction, but the new design saved weight by reducing the width of the frame spars and the main down tube by 10 millimeters. Suzuki also replaced the round tubing and the lower engine cradle with stamped square tubing to increase strength and further save weight. Both the swing arm pivot area and the rear subframe were also re-engineered to reduce flex and save a few precious ounces. Overall geometry was tighter for 2001 with a reduction in rake and trail of 1.2 degrees and 10 millimeters. On the scale, all of these changes to the frame added up to a savings of 1.28 pounds over 2000. The diet program was not limited to the frame either. A new fork retained the inverted design of 2000, but reduced weight by shaving down the diameter of the outer tubes by 2 millimeters. A new shock was also installed that saved nearly a pound by simplifying the compression circuit and installing a new lighter spring. New wheels for 2001 were lighter as well, and in the case of the front, slightly narrower. Both disc brakes were also lighter, with larger slots in the front and a reduction of 0.5 millimeters of width in the rear. The rear master cylinder and brake pedal were redesigned to save weight as well, and the front disc guard was deleted entirely. Even the plastic was shaved down in thickness for 2001 to save even more weight. In addition to being thinner, the new bodywork was formed out of a much brighter shade of yellow Suzuki dubbed Champion Yellow. On the motor side, Suzuki scrapped the outgoing mill completely and went with an entirely new design for 2001. To make the motor more compact, Suzuki moved the water pump back to the outside of the cases for the first time since 1998. This allowed them to shorten the overall length of the motor by 21 millimeters and made servicing the water pump much easier. The new motor maintained the case reed configuration it had enjoyed since 1989, but added an all new cylinder that featured a three degree less tilt than 2000. This was done to allow a straighter shot from the carburetor to the intake. Feeding that intake was an all new McCuny TMX 38S carburetor that dropped the PowerJet design used in 2000's Kahin mixer. The new carb was 104 grams lighter than in 2000 and featured a 14 millimeter shorter body to increase intake velocity. Internally, the new motor featured a 54 by 54.5 millimeter bore and stroke for a full 124.8 cc's of overall displacement. All new porting was added to the cylinder and the power valve mechanism was massaged to boost top end power. The ignition and crank were also modified to be lighter and more responsive. On the transmission side, there was a lower first and second gear installed to get the bike off the line quicker. The ratios for third through sixth remained unchanged, however. Because some riders had complained about the engagement of the clutch in the previous few years, Suzuki redesigned the clutch actuator for 2001 to provide a more positive engagement. Lastly, a new exhaust was bolted on to match the new porting profile. To save even more weight, the stampings on the pipe were thinner for 2001, and the exhaust hangers were changed from steel to aluminum. All told, the trimming and tucking program added up to an impressive 4 pounds rate reduction over 2000. On the track, the new RM125 ran similarly to the 2000, but with more power at every point on the curve. Like the year before, it was not a tractor, but it did pull decently well down low for a high-strung racing 125. Thankfully, all it took was a quick stab of the clutch to get the new motor up and in the meat of its power band. Once on the pipe, the yellow zonker pulled strongly through the mid-range and into an ear-splitting top-end hook. It was not as outright fast as the KTM 125 on top, but it was far better than the narrowly-powered KX and CR. 
For absolute novices, the slightly more forgiving YZ-125 powerband might have been better, but for anyone above the beginner class, the RM was an excellent and competitive choice. In the handling department, the new frame, layout, and suspension made the RM one of the best handling packages available in 2001. The new bodywork looked great, was super slim, and it made it easy to move around in the air and on the ground. Pretty much everyone below Travis Pastrana's 6 foot plus frame found the new layout to be comfortable and roomy. On the track, the new bright yellow RM continued RM's tradition of favoring turning prowess over high speed precision. In the twisties, the 01 RM had no peers. It was the king of the inside line and could carve circles around most of its rivals. Unlike many machines, the RM did not care if you were out of position or late on the throttle, just saw at the bars and the RM was happy to change direction. At speed, this nimbleness manifested itself in a rather disconcerting wander that made the bike feel less planted than bikes like the KX125. This trait was less apparent than previous RMs, but not completely exercised. On a high speed track, the RM was capable, but not confidence inspiring. Tightened things up though, and the RM came into its own. On the suspension end of things, Suzuki chose Shawa as the provider for their RM125 in 2001. This was in contrast to the equally new RM250, which employed Kiyaba components for suspension duties. To work best with the all new chassis, Suzuki's engineers spec'd a redesigned version of Shawa's twin chamber inverted cartridge forks for the new machine. These new 47mm forks were 2mm smaller than 2000 and featured a revised damping system for improved rider comfort. The new forks repositioned the spring to the bottom of the tubes for better weight distribution and added a separator to smooth operation by reducing air volume at full compression. They also added a low speed compression valve and spec'd a slightly lighter spring for 2001. On the shock side, Shawa was once again used as the provider and Suzuki made several changes aimed at saving weight and improving performance. First up was an all new damping system that added separate controls for high and low speed compression damping. The top shock mount was also changed to needle bearings for smoother action, and the entire linkage was redesigned. The new linkage was lighter overall and featured a revised rising rate for better response over small ripples and braking bumps. The 50mm shock body was all new as well and matched to a lighter, in actual weight, not spring rate, spring. In terms of performance, the RM125 offered one of the most well regarded suspension packages of 2001. The forks were plush, well damped, and excellent for anyone below the pro class. If you were heavier than the average 125 pilot or a fan of Pastrana style mega leaps, a switch to stiffer springs was probably advisable, but for most riders in the RM's target demo, they were excellent performers. On the shock side, the RM's Shawa damper was as well liked as its excellent forks. It was extremely plush on braking bumps and well controlled on hard hits. Like the forks, the shock could be a little soft for really fast guys, but most riders below the Pro Class loved his performance. With the new low and high speed compression circuits added to the rebound adjustability, there was an almost infinite amount of setting combinations available. While this raised the likelihood of getting lost down a settings rabbit hole, it also made the bike capable of better handling a wider variety of rider sizes and skill levels. For most riders, only a few clicks were required to get excellent performance out of the RM shock in 2001. On the detailing side, the RM was better thought out than previous Suzuki designs, but it was still a tick behind the best bikes in the class. The redesigned bodywork was well liked for its appearance and fitment, but the new thinner plastic was flimsy and not particularly durable. The stock graphics were even worse and destined to be shredded within a few rides. The new clutch offered a super light pull and smooth action, but not much in the way of durability. Even a moderate amount of clutch abuse, which was a requirement pretty much on any 125, left it slipping and begging for an aftermarket upgrade. Overall reliability was improved over previous Suzuki 125s, but it remained the quickest to wear out and the fastest to feel ratty if unattended. Things like the wimpy stock chain, butter soft sprockets, and chintzy steel bars made the RM feel cheap compared to bikes like the KTM 125. On the positive side of the equation were the RM's excellent ergonomics, sexy looks, supple suspension, powerful motor, sharp handling, and strong brakes. In 2001, Suzuki provided an excellent basis from which to build a title winning package. Out of the box, it was fast, well suspended, and competitive with anything else in the class. It was not as outright powerful as the KTM or as Stonax reliable as the Honda, but it was a far better overall machine than either one of them. In 2001, Suzuki nailed the elusive combination of usability, performance, and fun with their RM125. Light, flickable, and begging to be pinned to the stops, 
The 2001 RM125 was everything a great 125 should be. So there you have it. That's a look back at the RM125 for 2001, a machine that Suzuki, I think, really did a good job with. This wasn't necessarily a dominant machine. It certainly wasn't dominant in the way the early 80s Suzuki RMs were when they really were just kicking everybody's butt. But it was very competitive, certainly a solid choice. Depending on what you were looking for out of your 125, it was a really good choice. Uh, the RMs maybe didn't hold up as well as some like a Honda or maybe even the Yamaha, to be honest. That's the only problem with Suzuki's. They tend to wear it a little fast. But while it was running, it was very competitive. Good machine overall, and I think a lot of people still love them to this day. It's a well-regarded design. The styling's great, and you still see a lot of people building, uh, you know, restoring these things, which is a kind of an indication of how favorably people thought of the bike. So good machine overall. If you like to support what I do, make sure you check out my merch available at the, on my Teespring store. And if you could share, subscribe, comment below. I read all the comments. Give me an idea what you'd like to see next. I would, I definitely read them, and I take that into account when I'm researching this stuff. So I appreciate all the support, and uh, thanks for coming and checking out this video. Until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer for the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. Peace.